Welcome to All Real Estate All the Time with Whitney Nicely. Whitney is the principal broker for Whitney Buys Houses and the principal auctioneer for Nicely Done Auctions. She owns a real estate portfolio, including land, houses, and apartment buildings across East Tennessee. Whitney will teach you how to purchase real estate for profit and help you achieve lifelong goals. You don't need to be a real estate agent to be a good real estate investor. And now the star of her own show, Whitney Nicely. Hello, everybody. Hello, this is Whitney Nicely, and you're listening to All Real Estate all the time. And I had a ton of calls last week from the show, so I've invited my husband, Jason. Good morning. I've invited my husband back to the studio with me because I guess y'all like his sweet, south georgia southern draw or maybe you like the banter back and forth but anyway after we left after we got done last week i had two voicemails from people that were listening and on monday and tuesday how many calls did i have from people that listened to the show on saturday morning i don't know you told me a lot but i thought maybe you were just trying to make me feel good So, people are listening. It's bright and early, and it's beautiful out in East Tennessee, and we are heading to the lake as soon as we get done with this. So, if you call on Saturday and I don't answer, it's because we're somewhere on Norris Lake where there isn't cell phone service. (laughs) So, try me back Monday through Friday, okay? I like to buy houses, but I like to buy houses during banker hours. (laughs) So, what are we going to talk about today, babe? Uh, You tell me. Let's talk about real estate. Sounds good. (laughs) <laughs> last week we talked about kind of how to set some goals and what you're going to look for in real estate and what kind of deals you're looking for when people call me a lot of times they want to tell me more than i need to know like on monday one of the ladies that called she called and said that well i mean i was on the phone with her for 15 minutes and i really only needed to be on the phone with her for about two because the truth of it was she hadn't made a payment in a year and I don't deal with houses once they're that far behind on payments. Okay. So if you have a house and you're behind on payments and you're still living in it, it's too, too far into the F word for me. Okay. I don't deal with foreclosures, but if you're looking at a house that you have and you're looking out towards the fall and you realize that maybe you can't make the payments, then call me now and let's get a plan going. Um, I have some houses available that are kind of like that. So you can look on WhitneyBuysHouses.com and see the houses we have available. So you said a little bit about people call and they want to give you too much information. Um, what kind of information are you looking for uh, when you uh, you know try to pick out properties that are suitable for you? I really like empty houses. I love empty houses. Okay. And empty house could be a vacant house. It could be a house that, um, say you get transferred and you have to leave. You were going to Nashville and they want you on the job like next week. The house is empty. Call me. Don't be making payments on an empty house or say you're a landlord and you're tired of landlording and you're going to kick your tenants out. Like we looked at some apartments like this, a guy that listens to us on the, in the morning called and said, Hey, I've got some, what was it? Two duplexes in a house. And he said, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Y'all come get it. (laughs) So we went and looked at it, made him an offer. He had empty commercial units, and that's what we're looking for. Uh, Why do you like the empty ones better than something that's occupied? Honestly, it's a lot easier to deal with empty houses. If you still live in a house, I don't care how convincing you are to yourself you are still emotionally and financially involved in the house you still cook dinner here every night you put your kids to bed here this is still the heart and soul of your family unit and i like you to be gone it's easier for me to show a house when i know that there's not any dogs in it it's easier for me to show a house when i know that i don't have to make sure that it's going to be clean it's empty and i like it it's just a lot easier to deal with an empty house than an occupied house. So you stated you'd like for people to call and just give you the facts that you need to know. Uh, Start to finish, uh, how long would it say it takes you to analyze a property and decide whether or not it's a good fit for you? Well, when you call, sometimes you'll get my voicemail. Like if we're out on the lake, you're going to get my voicemail. Leave me your name and address and phone number and I'll call you back when I can. I like to call sellers back between seven and eight in the morning seven a.m 
to 8 a.m. is prime time for me to be talking to sellers. Um, and I line them up in about 15 minute blocks. So I can talk to you about your property for 15 minutes. And a lot of times, I can tell you by the end of those 15 minutes if it's something I even want to set up an appointment to come and see or not. One thing I will tell you, though, is if your house is listed with an agent, I don't want it. I don't want to know about it. Don't send me the address about it. Don't send me the MLS briefing about it. Don't call and tell me how awful your agent is. I don't want to know a thing about your house if another agent has a listing agreement on it. Don't even, don't waste my time or your time. If you're coming up and you know your contract is expiring at the end of September, then go ahead and put it on your calendar that the day it expires to call me and let me look at it. Let me analyze it then. But also... I had a guy that called me, he listens to the radio show, and he called me and said, hey, my listing is expired. You told me to call when the listing was expired. It's expired. It expired yesterday, so I'm calling today. How soon can you come look at it? Otherwise, I'm going to put it back on the MLS tomorrow. And I was like, hold on, y'all. Let's think about it like this. If it, if it is on the MLS and it's listed for sale and nobody buys it after a year, there's something wrong with it, right? Yes. It could be the location. Probably not. It could be that it's outdated. Maybe. Could be the price is wrong. It could be that there's no comps to support it. It could be a whole number of reasons. But putting a property on the MLS, trying to sell a property, is like baking a cake. You got to put all these ingredients together and then you put it out there on the market and you wait on the market to come back and tell you if. You're on the right track or not or what you need to do or what you don't need to do and a lot of times keeping it in the oven or keeping it on the mls is not actually what you need to do you need to let it rest before you put the icing on and you may want to let it rest and keep it off the market because just because you put it back up with another agent that doesn't automatically mean the offers are going to come in well, I think it's a common misconception. Most people want to blame the realtor, right? If it didn't sell, it's because the realtor didn't hustle. They didn't market it correctly. Uh, when, you know, a lot of times you just need to look in the mirror uh, and try to find out what it is about the property. You know, one of the things is we see a lot, is it functionally obsolete, right? What? what? Is it functionally obsolete? What does that mean? Uh, that means do I have to go through a bedroom to get to a common bathroom? Uh, you know, people do some wicked, funky designs when they build houses from time to time. Wait uh, a second. They do some wicked, funky designs when they add on as needed. I don't think architects or designers set out to make weird, funky houses. I think as people expand houses with or without permits and with or without an idea of what they're doing, that's when the houses get kind of funky. Um, for the most part, I would uh, agree. Uh, we looked at a lake property at auction two weeks ago, though, that I would consider uh, a choppy and functionally obsolete design, and it was built from the ground up. So there are those out there as well. It was really cool. It actually had a theater in the basement, but the theater room wasn't that exciting, was it? No. It probably should have just been another bedroom. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we got functionally obsolete houses. Most of the houses around here aren't functionally obsolete, though, are they? How can you tell? Can you tell from the street if a house is going to be weird on the inside? Uh, normally, no. Uh, there are, to your point, some additions that uh, you could tell from the outside that it's going to be uh, a little bit strange uh, or a little bit obsolete. Uh, but most of the time, you have to go in the house. I think some houses, you can tell it used to be a garage and they've closed it in and made it like a family room now i think those are functionally obsolete because they still kind of feel like a garage they don't really feel like the living room and a lot of times that was done i think that was popular in the 70s or 80s and so they're paneled and there's usually a couple steps down or a couple steps up to them and it just I don't know. Is it a garage? Is it a laundry room? Is it a bonus room? I mean, your parents have a place like that. They use it for the treadmill room, right? Yes. Actually, their room is the catch-all room now, isn't it? <laughs> it is. Okay. So that that's another good point. If you're trying to sell a house, even if you do have one of these uh, garages that were turned into the catch-all room, what would you suggest or what do I usually tell people when I see that? tear down the walls 
<laughs> no, get all the junk out. Go ahead and make it look as empty as possible. You can tear down the walls if you want to, but a lot of times this was a carport that was turned into a garage that was turned into a living room. And you're looking at a brick wall. I'd say tear down the walls and expose the brick wall. Look at that industrial look of the house. Bring, you know, sort of that yuppie vibe to it. Make something out of it. Make it a sunroom. Do something weird or cool with it. So just to remind y'all, this is Whitney Nicely. I've got my husband, Jason, in the studio with me today. And we are talking about houses and things people say when they call. Just remember, I do buy houses. Whitney buys houses. 865 865- 309-4500 or check out our website we've got houses for sale right now whitneybuyshouses.com Welcome back to All Real Estate, All the Time with Whitney Nicely, where we teach you the ins and outs of buying real estate in Knoxville. Now, here's Whitney. I had so much fun bringing my husband to the studio last week that I've decided to bring him again today. So my handsome husband, Jason, is here with me this weekend. And when you get two real estate nerds like us together, I mean, our our dinner conversations are pretty boring, aren't they? Uh, depends on the day. <laughs> it depends on what kind of deal we've been looking at. That's right. And it depends on what kind of flip we're talking about. Yeah. Your your appetite's a little different from mine sometimes. No no pun intended. You mean I want pasta and you want steak? Or what do you mean my appetite's different? No, I mean, uh, you know, you want to totally gut it to the studs and uh, I just want to do a few cosmetic things. I don't believe that. I was the one that wanted to paint it all one color and you convinced me that we need to get fancy with the paint. And trim it out. And that was just an outlier. No. I want to do the lipstick on a pig thing. You're the one that wants to gut everything out. Okay, fair point. <laughs> um, you know, after the show last week, I uh, had a couple of people call me that listened and said, hey, you know, it was pretty good. Uh, you got a little deep in the analytics there when we were talking about some of the ratios. And uh, I apologize because that's just the, the financial nerd in me. It's boring, babe. But, um, you know... People said it, it was good dialogue back and forth. And one thing people want to know is, how do you choose what to invest in? Oh, ooh, I got this one. I got this one. Well, wait a second. How do we choose what house to buy or what apartment to buy? Hey, am I buying vacant land? Am I buying industrial? Am I buying uh, residential? Do I want to do, uh, you know, small multifamily, meaning a duplex or a quadplex? Or should I just break out and go big and just look for a hundred unit apartment complex? I have a pop quiz that'll help you answer all these questions. You can go to reipopquiz.com. It's like 10 questions and it'll tell you what kind of investor you're going to be. And it, it's kind of fun, and it's it's enlightening. A- Adam took it one morning when we were in here, and he liked it. I failed. You didn't fail. That's not a pass-fail. <laughs> it's what kind of investor will you be? So day-to-day, uh, you know, you obviously have a wide range and a pretty diverse portfolio. How do you decide what to focus on? Do you have things that you are targeting, or do you just wait and see what kind of deals fall your way? I have a formula. In houses, I have a formula. And a lot of times in land, I have a formula too. Um, We have spreadsheets. I mean, geez, you've got a huge Excel spreadsheet that we have to go through every time we make an apartment deal. But for the most part, in houses and land, I've got one formula that we go by. And I will tell you that when you call me, I want to know, it's not that I don't care about your story and I don't care that your grandma lived in this house for 96 years and that everybody was you know, raised here. And it's not that I don't care about the story. It's just that I don't really care about your story. I want to know, I want to know what's really important. What kind of, what is about this house that I can use, that I can make money on, that I can help you, that I can help the sell, uh, I can help the buyer too. And it makes me think of, um, there's a quote from an old movie. You're older than I am. What, what was that? The detective's name was Friday, I think. And he said that it was, um, 
What? He, just the facts? Just the facts, ma'am. Uh, I think you're talking about Dragnet. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Pl- will you play that again, Adam? You're so quick on that. Just the facts, ma'am. That's what I want to know. When you call me and you have a property or a house or apartment or anything for sale, I just want the facts, okay? What year was it built? How big is it? Does it have a garage? Do you owe a mortgage on it? Is it free and clear? And in fact, I get pretty nitty gritty down into your personal, quote unquote, personal business. And I'm going to say, what is your payment amount every month? Does that include taxes and insurance? That's important for me because it goes into my formula. I have to know this information. And when I teach other people to start buying houses and investing in real estate, it's important to know what your payoff is, to know if you're underwater or not, to know if there's equity built up, to know if there's a second mortgage. That's important stuff to know. It's also important to know what the payment is. I mean, I don't know that you didn't wrap your car payment into your house payment somehow. And if you're paying $1,500 for a house in a $600 neighborhood, something's wrong. And I don't want to get too involved in that. Yeah, I'm going to tell you a little secret here. The uh, lead sheet that you developed, uh, you know, for us to take calls and analyze properties is great. Uh, but I'm going to let you in a little secret. Uh, the part where you actually ask the homeowner what they think the house is worth, all mine have a little scratch line through that because I found out that at the end of the day, that doesn't really matter. And nine times out of 10, it's not even in the ballpark to begin with. We're not playing baseball here, and I do think it matters. Okay, I think it's important to know if I'm talking to Mr. Seller and I say, well, how much is your house worth? And he says, a hundred, I owe a hundred, it's worth a hundred. Then that tells me what kind of frame of mind he's in. If he says it's worth a hundred and he owes 50 and he'll take 50, he seems more motivated to me. So I think it is important to know what the seller thinks their house is worth and see if they, to use your term, see if they're in the ballpark or not. I think that's important. We'll have to agree to disagree on that one. <laughs> okay, fine. So what what's something that you look at then from the lead sheet? What's the most important thing that you want to know when somebody calls in and they want to sell me their property? For me, it's why are you selling the property? If I can get somebody that gives me an honest answer uh, about that, I kind of know their appetite. I kind of know what kind of situation that they're in. And and I know how to structure the deal to help them. I mean, we do deals in so many different ways that, you know, come from somebody outright buying the property uh, to doing a subject to deal, you know, where the mortgage actually stays in their name. But, you know, we take the obligation off of them to make all the payments to, Um, you know, a lease option, which may be, uh, you know, something that's attractive to them to get money up front, uh, payments ongoing, and and then get the rest of the money on the back end. So to me, it's, you know, what situation are you in that's leading you to, uh, you know, need to, to sell or walk away from this property? You know, what I've been noticing is a lot of the sellers that are calling me lately have these opportunities that I can take over these houses with a lease option, give them some money. And I'm not talking about big money. I'm talking like a thousand dollars or something, just some money, take over their payments. And most of the sellers I've been talking to lately, guess how long they've been giving me to cash out their mortgage? Five years. Nope. They have been giving me the rest of their mortgage. Wow. (laughs) Okay. So I talked to a lot of people that you know, they're in a good situation. It's not always that I'm talking to desperate, motivated, you know, clinging on for dear life kind of sellers. I talk to good, honest, well-balanced people who just need, they need help. They need somebody with an outside perspective to come in and take this issue off their hands. And for whatever reason, they like They like my style. They like the way that I buy houses. They like the way that I can talk to them and I can market it. And, you know, I tell everybody that worst case scenario, I sell the house. (laughs) So interest rates are at or near historic lows. Uh, What are some of the reasons that you look at a subject to deal where you take somebody's existing mortgage that might have a little bit higher interest rate than, than what the market's offering today, you know, versus just going to the bank uh, and just getting funding from them to buy the property. Do you want the short answer? I want the answer that most of the people can understand. If I go get a mortgage, because I mean, let's be honest, I don't carry a hundred grand around in my pocket. Okay. So 
if I don't have $100,000 to cash out your $100,000 house, one, I'm not going to make any money if I pay $100,000 and it's worth $100,000, okay? And shockingly enough, I like to make money. <laughs> I like to spend money too, don't I, babe? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so it's very important that in my real estate deals, when I buy houses, I make some money. And if I'm not going to make any money, then I don't want to buy the house. But one way that I can buy a $100,000 house and I can buy it for, you know, closer to your payoff. Say your payoff is 80 or 85 and, you know, you're just trying to get rid of this headache. You don't really want to make that extra 15. You can let me take over the payments on it on a subject to deal or a lease option deal or something. And I can make money. I can build up my portfolio. I can help you get out of these payments that you don't want. And I can help a buyer get into a house while they rebuild their credit and establish a job history and do all those other things that my buyers do. Uh, what about all those fees that you see on the HUD statement when you show up at the bank for closing? Okay, so that's the real answer. <laughs> if I buy a house and I have to go get a mortgage on it, I have to put money down. I have to pay the origination fees. I have to put 20% down or I have to put 3% down or I have to do all this crazy stuff. And the only people that really make any money is the mortgage broker. And I have mortgage broker friends. That's fine. But I think in the whole regular real estate world, the only people that are really making good money is the mortgage broker. Because the agents, y'all have heard me rant and rave about this before. The listing agent and the selling agent, they're making pennies on the dollar compared to what the investor is making. They're making pennies on the dollar compared to what the mortgage broker is making, especially when you consider the time and effort that the agent has involved versus, I know the mortgage broker has some time and effort involved, but it's not that wear and tear on their car and their cell phone and their family life like the agent has. All right, I'm being cut off. We'll be back in just a second. This is all real estate all the time with Whitney Nicely. Welcome back to All Real Estate, All the Time with Whitney Nicely, where we teach you the foundation of real estate investing for profits. Now, here's Whitney. Do you know what one of the coolest things is from doing this radio show? I mean, one of the absolute coolest things from doing this radio show. Uh, I bet you're going to tell us. <laughs> People love to call and ask me questions, and a lot of them call during the week, during banker hours, and they've got tons of questions for me. Like one guy called last week and he said that he listens to the show, he loves it, it's fun, blah, 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 blah. But do I buy houses in Sevier County? And yes, I love to buy houses in Sevier County. Another guy called and said, do I buy houses in Newport? And I said, no way. I go through Newport on 40, get into North Carolina, and that is about it. So if you're interested in where I buy, it's mostly any county that touches Knox County. I'm interested in any county that touches Knox County, especially the east side of Knoxville, out Rutledge Pike, Asheville Highway, and Jefferson County. I love Jefferson County. Have y'all been out there? I mean, it's beautiful. There's two lakes on each side of it. What could be better? Uh, why do you choose to focus on those areas? Because I like it out there and it's pretty. <laughs> is that the woman answer or is that the investor answer? Well, that's a common question that I think a lot of first-time real estate investors, um, you know, want to want to know is where should I focus? Oh. And the easy answer to begin with is focus on something in your neighborhood, something that you drive by all the time, something that you can kind of you know keep up with progress, especially if it's your first rehab, uh, and you know you're not a, a general contractor or some things like that. But you know, long term. You know, you have a lot of real estate investors that, you know, whether it be in buying tax lien properties, you know, they begin to focus on areas outside of their core footprint, which may be, you know, across the U.S., um, you know, in adjacent states, um, whatever the case may be. Why have you chosen to mainly, uh, you know, pick an area in East Tennessee and, and kind of focus on that primary area? 
Okay, I understand now. I wasn't, I guess I wasn't computing. You know, sometimes Jason says that I hear things differently than how he meant it, or he says something like that. I don't know. I'm usually not listening to him when he says those things. (laughs) But, okay, so your question is, why do I choose my little honey holes? And it's because I love Rutledge Pike because I've already got property on Rutledge Pike. My mom had property on Rutledge Pike. I live off Rutledge Pike. And like Jason just said, I love to buy houses in my neighborhood so that as I improve them, I'm improving the value of my house as well. So you can improve your house, but it's going to max out at what the neighborhood says. It's like being the um, chain on a fence or the chain and the rope. What is that? Where you're only as strong as your weakest chain. Yeah, the weakest link. That's the one. (laughs) I'm getting all my words messed up. I need more coffee. (laughs) But anyway, that's true. Your neighborhood is only as strong as the ugliest house. And so if I can go through in my neighborhood and buy those ugly, empty, vacant houses and give them some life back, I improve the whole neighborhood. And why wouldn't I want to do that in my neighborhood? I'm already invested in my neighborhood. I already love my neighborhood. And it's also really good for word of mouth. Once I put one of those bright pink Whitney Buys Houses signs in the yard, everybody knows, oh, there she got another one. There she is. She's flipping another one. Maybe I should call her and come get mine. It's just across the street. But so it just, it helps. I really think it helps. And agents do the same thing. A lot of agents will pick a honey hole and they will only focus in, you know, Fourth and Gill. Or they will only focus on the condos downtown. Or they will only focus on anything in the Farragut school zone. And they're not really interested in going clear across the countryside to look at this, that, and the other. They focus on where they've had success. And I've had success out Rutledge Pike, Asheville Highway, the east side of Knox County, Carter, all of that, Gibbs, all of that. I love it out there. And I'll tell you that a lot of investors, a lot of our buddies, where do they want to flip? west knoxville so why would i want to go out west and compete with all of our buddies when i can go play in my own little play box on the east side of town i love it over there that's a good point um for somebody that's looking at new uh uh ways to to invest and and may actually be a first-time investor um you know what price range and what home type value would you encourage them to start with Uh, that's another one that i get uh emailed all day every day is you know what price range should i be looking in should i look for something that's really run down and i might can pick up for you know 20 or thirty thousand, or you know should i look for a hundred thousand dollar house that after you know i fix it up and repair it's going to be worth you know 175 kind of where is that area that you would encourage people to look uh, and, and does that depend on which area that they're actually investing in? I tell all of my coaching students that the last thing I want them to do is sink their entire life savings or inheritance or insurance payoff or whatever large chunk of money they have. The last thing I want them to do is sink it all into one project so that all of their hopes and dreams and future hopes and dreams are relying on one property especially as the first one, like that just makes me sick to my stomach. I tell everybody that they need to start in land because once you buy land, you can buy land for $1,000, $2,000, a small, relatively small chunk of change, and you don't have everything invested in it. But the process is the same. So if you buy an ugly piece of land that's covered in trees and grass and weeds, It's real easy to go in and clean it up and then put it back on the market and sell it again for more money. So the only thing that changes between a land transaction and an apartment transaction is how many steps are in between. So if you can do a land deal, which is smaller money, smaller investment, smaller time, all of that, then you just add zeros and questions on the next deal. You add zeros and questions on the first house. You add zeros and questions on the first apartment. It just gets bigger and broader, but I don't think people should just jump in with nothing and sink everything into it. I really encourage people to start with land. So if you take that approach and you kind of build knowledge as you go along and you do more deals, um, it's going to take you a while to acquire the knowledge that you need to have before a real estate investing career can kind of surpass um, you know, what, what your current day job is or, or actually become your primary source of income, right? But on TV, it looks so easy. 
I mean, are you serious? It's going to take me time and effort and energy to build up a million dollar portfolio? Um, yes. <laughs> but people call me all the time and they're like, hey, I watched this show last night. Don't you love it when they go in and they do blah, blah, blah? And I'm like, no, stop watching the shows. Go out, buy something, put your time, sweat, and energy into it, and then you'll see how boring those shows are. I can't stand those shows. And I, I have often thought about videoing myself watching these shows and pointing out all of the flaws with these shows. Like, I think it would be kind of entertaining. But it's not, it's not a quick step solution. It's not a get rich scheme. It's, there's some work involved. It's usually more fun than sitting in a cubicle and, you know, doing data entry or something. And it also helps if you've got a boisterous personality. Would you call me boisterous? Uh, yeah, they probably have your picture in the dictionary <laughs> next to that. But. So it helps that you like to talk to people, but we know plenty of investors that are not as loud and proud as I am or as annoying as I am, and they're very successful because they are good at having conversations with the people. And, you know, when I say I don't really care about your story, maybe they care a little bit more so they get more deals, whereas I just want the facts. Okay. So... You, you started to ask Just me. Just the facts, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> so you started to ask me, I think, how I can decide where I'm going to go and what's going to be a good deal. Because I have a house right now that's in Powell, and that's not necessarily the east side of town. But it was a good deal. The people wanted to leave. They were, you know, in a hurry to leave. They needed to move to get their kids into school. So I have a gorgeous four-sided brick house in Powell that's available for a lease option now. And a lot of people get confused because when they see my lease option, whether it's on Craigslist or Zillow or wherever they are, they'll call and they'll say, but is the house for sale? I'm like, heck yes. If you're pre-approved and you want to buy this thing, I'll roll out the red carpet for you. Come on down. <laughs> so just because it says lease option, that doesn't mean that I won't make a deal. And that's what I tell a lot of investors. They go in and they know it's going to be a negotiation, right? So the seller wants this much. I want to give this much. We have to negotiate to hit in the middle. But it's n the negotiation is never over. As far as I'm concerned, you are always negotiating something. Whether you're negotiating with the seller or you're negotiating with a buyer or you're negotiating your price for the contractor or some other people that kind of tend to waste money in real estate transactions, then you are always negotiating. And on my Facebook news feed today, or yeah, today it had a picture last summer. We went to Lowe's in Georgia and bought some light fixtures. Do you remember that? I negotiated with the guy in Lowe's for light fixtures. And what it was, these light fixtures were on the clearance rack. They were already half price. But I, I got the little guy over there and I was talking to him and I said, you know, come on, what's the best you can do on these? So he ended up marking the light fixtures down from half price to even more than half price. I felt like by the time I was leaving, they were gonna be paying me to take these light fixtures out. So even if you are flipping houses, remember that sometimes the marked price is not always the sales price you know what i mean absolutely all right so i am looking for a three bedroom two bath house right now and i like it on the east side of town but if you got it anywhere in knox county please call whitney buys houses 865-309-4500 and also check out the houses we have available whitneybuyshouses.com Welcome back to All Real Estate, all the time, with the only general contractor in town who wears a dress every day, Whitney Nicely. All right, it is hot out in East Tennessee, and we got some hot topics in here today. We've been talking about how you can buy houses, how I buy houses, what I need to know, what I don't need to know. But, you know, most of it I probably do need to know. When I say that I don't really care about your story when you call and I just want the facts, then what I really mean is... Just the facts, ma'am. <laughs> just the facts. I really just want the facts. It is kind of important in the story that if you tell me your grandfather built this house and then the, um, you know, the foundation started to buckle or there was water keeping keep going into the house, then that is kind of important part of your story. But ultimately, the story doesn't affect me as much as you might think it does. I'm not paying for your memories. I'm paying for the product. 
and the product in this ha- position is the house. So, all right, I cut you off earlier too, Jason. So my husband's in the studio with me this morning trying to keep me on track and in line, which is a full-time job, but he's trying to do that on the radio today too. <laughs> well, you were talking a little bit earlier about how you isolate which areas you want to work on. How do you isolate uh, which properties you might be interested in? And, you know, you talked about starting small and working your way up and gaining knowledge. Um, you know, I'm a little bit on the other side of that coin because you were so far in the real estate um, realm when I met you that, you know, I didn't really know anything. And, um, you know, you taught me a lot in a very short period of time. Oh, you're sweet. So, you know, the the other way, rather than just kind of learning as you go, is to actually talk to somebody uh, who is a seasoned investor. Um, you know, there's people out there that uh, are willing to, um, you know, lend you their time, uh, usually in exchange sometimes for a little bit of your money. Money, um, honey. But, um, you know, you, you gain that knowledge much quicker. Uh, you know, there's also a lot of people out there. Uh, one of the people that I've dealt with uh, in, in talking about different strategies, um, you know, sometimes they'll actually volunteer and say, listen, I'll be glad to partner with you on this um, if we can work out a deal where I get some sort of equity and just kind of learn as you go with the pros, as I would put it. I don't do that, but I do coach people on how to invest in real estate. And I've got a couple different programs. I've got a couple different opportunities. I had a guy email me last week and he wanted me to analyze a deal. He was looking at buying a property in Knoxville and he wanted me to look at it. And I said, that's fine, but here's my hourly rate. And then I didn't hear back from him. <laughs> so y'all are welcome to send me an email and let me look at your deals and do this, or you're welcome to sign up for my coaching. And I'd be glad to get you into the program that starts on Monday, August the 1st. It's a nine day intensive program for um i think it's called what is it real estate cash flow system yeah because that's what everybody wants they want more cash flow through real estate so bring it on y'all if you want to you can go to all about rei.com find out all the details fill out my application and it's kind of short notice now but i'd be glad to book a call with you and make sure that you are the kind of person that i'm looking for for my program and i will tell you that there's three or four people in Knoxville in my program and he seemed to be making offers and kicking tail and taking names on lead sheets <laughs> and that's another thing you know Jason mentioned that some coaches will want to you'll pay into their program and then they'll kind of handhold you through the process I'm not going to do that as much because I like to show you how to go get deals and I want you to learn how to close deals I don't want you to depend on me for your deals okay I've got I got plenty of houses. I've got lots of houses. I've got lots of deals myself going on and I'd love to buy more. If you want me to look at buying your house, that's fine. If you want me to look at, look at your deal and evaluate it, that's fine. You can send me an email. You can um, look me up on Facebook. Oh, speaking of Facebook, we mentioned it earlier and I want y'all to know that a lot of people send me emails or they call me and they've got questions that they want me to cover, but it would be really awesome if you go to Whitney Buys Houses Facebook page and say, hey, say you listen to me on the radio, say good morning, say whatever you want to, and then say, I want you to cover this topic. I'm really interested in fill in the blank. I'm really curious about how this works. What does it look like from this side of real estate versus that side? And that way I kind of know what y'all want to hear from me because I can talk about real estate. That's fine. <laughs> but if I know exactly what you want, these shows will be awesome. No, that's a good point. Um, you know, you obviously want to cover the stuff that people are interested in, in hearing about. Um, I'm not a Facebooker, but that sounds like a great idea. He's not a Facebooker, but I do enough for both of us, don't I? That's, yes. I love Facebook. And I get leads from Facebook. The Powell House came from Facebook. I bought it from Facebook. I'll probably sell it on Facebook. It's a great way. It's a great marketing tool. And I've got a webinar about how you should be and could be using it to make money. It's not a time waster. It's a money maker if you know how to use it correctly. All right. So you've asked me what area of town I want to invest in, I'm going to throw the ball back to you and say, where do you want to invest? What do you look for when you start investing? Um, you know, we talked a little bit about last week for those that, that didn't catch that show that I'm more into the multifamily. I, I would rather buy apartments and, and things like that. And we went into some of those reasons uh, on the last show. Um, you know, for me, it's more about the opportunity uh, than it is the area. 
Um, it's more about uh, the financial analysis. And, you know, Whitney mentioned that we have uh, a spreadsheet that's out there. Um, a gigantic spreadsheet. And, you know, she talked about the facts. Um, you know, normally when you're talking about multifamily uh, housing and uh, those type of opportunities are out there, people are more accustomed to what facts and figures that you do need. Um, I would say within five minutes, I can analyze a property and let you know if it's worth, uh, you know, me making an offer on that property or not. Um, you know, right now we have continued to focus on uh, East Tennessee. To be honest with you, the best deals are, you know, what we call pocket listings, which means, you know, an agent or, or somebody else may be aware of an opportunity, but it hasn't been put out on the MLS or it hasn't been put into some kind of online marketing strategy. And, you know, you find out those deals through networking. So it's not uncommon, you know, for somebody, whether it be my property manager, it might be somebody I go to church with. It could actually be my banker that has a golfing buddy that says, Hey, I got this, uh, listing that I know about the people are, you know, interested in selling. Why don't you give them a call and, you know, kind of see what the circumstances are. And, you know, a lot of times we find deals that way that are, that are really not even on market properties. And sometimes those end up being not only the easiest to negotiate uh, in, in terms of financial interest, they're the easiest as well. I, I agree. And going on that tangent, sometimes it's easier to say what I don't want to buy. And I will tell you that I don't want to buy mobile homes. You know what I do want to buy? A mobile home park. Yay! You know me so well, honey. I do. I would buy a mobile home park. But I don't want to just buy a mobile home out on a couple acres in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee. That doesn't really interest me. Now, and I say that because I buy houses and I like to target a certain kind of market. I like pretty houses. I'm not flipping houses this year. I want to have a pretty house that a nice regular middle class family can move into, start making payments on, send the kids to school or work and live and play and whatever in without having to gut the kitchen. So... I just haven't found that in mobile homes. Now, mobile home park, y'all call me. Whitney Buys Houses, 865-309-4500. I love mobile home parks, apartment complexes. You were wanting to buy storage units too, weren't you? Oh, yeah. Storage units are great. Uh, they have no toilets in those guys. You don't get calls about a leaky toilet or a leaky faucet. Hey, I took a survey on Facebook the other day. I've got a house out on Millertown Pike, and it's got an extra two-car garage, a detached two-car garage, which would make, a, I think, a perfect workshop. But my Facebook survey said, what would you do if you had this much extra space? And I was trying to get, you know, those those comments and mostly they come from the men i don't know why men are more attracted to garages than women that's usually the only space that we're allowed to have <laughs> okay then that kind of makes sense okay so i had a bunch of men comment on this place and one of the guys said where is it i don't care i already know what i want to do with it where is it can i come look at it and another guy answered and said that he would make it a workshop and he would put a welder out there and he would do all this stuff to it but then he sent me a text message and he was like or we could do something different. And he was kind of making an uh, allusion to, you know, making drugs or something like that. And I told him, no, there wasn't any water. And that's why we like storage units too, because you, you can't do anything really bad to them. There's no water. There's no toilets. The tenants pay on credit cards. Storage units are amazing. Uh, yeah. I had a friend of mine that only exclusively invest in storage units. Tell me one time uh, I asked him, I said, what is, what is it you love most about storage unit? Uh, you know, versus mobile home parks or, or other commercial properties. And he said, I have found that storage units puke money. He <laughs> said, it doesn't matter what I do. Uh, you know, I, you can go, you know, full end, uh, you know, really high end uh, climate controlled units, or you can go bare bones, metal units on a concrete pad. He goes, if you do a little bit of research on the location, he goes, it's almost a, a philosophy where I would say you can't lose. Now, we know it is possible to lose, but we're in it to win it, aren't we, babe? That's right. And I, I will tell you that I've got three houses available right now. I've got a commercial building available right now. I've got lots of stuff going on on WhitneyBuysHouses.com. So if you're interested in buying something in Knoxville, check out what I have available. If you want to sell something, there's a Submit Your Property Information tab there. You can set up an appointment to call me, 865-309-4500. That's Whitney Buys Houses. And also... 
Don't forget about the pop quiz, reipopquiz.com. Thanks for coming. Send us some topics for the show, too. <laughs> 